thank you so much for coming. Um, this is such a wonderful crowd. Um, really, really excited about <clears throat> talking about this work. <clears throat> um, Linda and I have been uh, working on this project for almost two years, um, about a year and a half. Um, feels like 10. <laughs> it does feel like a while. Um, I became the curator here in May of 2008. Um, uh, and soon afterwards reached out to Linda. Um, I was so excited about this show um, and as Javier just mentioned to you, um, the context uh, that this show is within is, is very exciting. Um, you know, we, we rebranded in March to Via Victoria Center for the Arts. Um, formerly we were um, Casa de la Cultura Center for Latino Arts. And when we rebranded, <clears throat> um, we altered our mission somewhat, um, and that included um, cross dynamic, cross-cultural collaborations. Um, and so we've been, uh, little by little, been incorporating that into um, the exhibitions here in the gallery. Um, so it's no, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not news to anyone that Linda is not Hispanic or Latino. Um, <laughs> um, but, um, but her, uh, her show really does um, wonderful things for this program um, and what we really aim to do here in the gallery. Um, basically, you know, we, uh, when we first started meeting, uh, I was overwhelmed by the sheer amount of work um, that Linda has produced over uh, nine years. I believe this year it'll be 10. Yeah. The first trip was in 2000 and Linda will give us some more details about um, her, her trips to Cuba. Um, but the, the sheer amount of work is really, uh, from the project, is incredibly overwhelming. Um, and I was really delighted uh, in our studio visits to go through and to really, uh, to find uh, real images of, of, of humanity. Uh, and I really feel like that's the, the bottom line with a lot of this work. Um, there are some really incredible glimpses into some um, cultural, some Cuban cultural affectations, um, as well as some Jewish cultural affectations. Um, and I think where those lines sort of begin to blend, uh, I really feel like is where this, the work really um, is incredibly strong. Um, uh, I, um, without, I wanna go into some depth as to exactly what kind of themes uh, are in the work. Um, you know, but before I do that, before we get into a discussion about the work itself, um, I want to uh, introduce Linda Hirsch and have her uh, speak to us about her experience and um, experiences, plural, um, uh, and the work itself. Linda? Thank you. That was wonderful. Evan has been uh, just tremendous, tremendously helpful, um, as he said, uh, years and years of images, hundreds, I don't even know how many, and they're all film captured. All my images from, from Cuba have been film captured, uh, which then meant I had to scan and digitize and organize, and it still hasn't been completed. There are many images I can't even find. <laughs> so um, thank you to the center, and muchas gracias to Evan for his patience and his endurance. I think We've broken a lot of records, um, broken a lot of traditions as well um, with this show. Uh, it was intended initially to be a two-person show with a Cuban colleague, a very gifted female colleague who, when we started talking, lived in Cuba, Cuba, and then sought asylum in the U.S. And I thought, oh, it will be easy now. She's in the U.S. We can do a show together. When in effect, it made it harder, and it wasn't possible because to come here from another country and to immerse yourself and to get certified as a doctor, which she is, has taken her away from now this conversation that I have had to have with myself. It's, it's kind of surreal. Um, the looking glass motif, which is alluded to in some of my writings and in the mirror piece, the installation piece, um, I, over nine years of immersing myself little by little, into Cuban culture and the Jewish Cuban culture um, have come to look at myself differently. Uh, we can get back to that. And um, 
it's caused me to look at my religious and spiritual, spiritual beliefs differently and to look at my fellow human beings with greater affection and, um, and compassion. Because when you go through that looking glass into any other culture, especially the Cuban one, which is so complicated and paradoxical and changing with such a lot of history, uh, you know, it's like being thrown into the deep end of the pool, thrown out of a boat into the ocean. Um, and it takes a lot of patience and humility, great deal of patience and humility to step back and say, who am I, an outsider, to enter this culture, even though I understand the religion of the Jewish faith, um, who am I to tell their story? So in the middle of this nine-year period during which I have immersed myself, in the middle I had an epiphany and I realized, you know, I can continue telling my version of my experiences, but it's still my story. And I began to raise money for and provide cameras to the teenagers that I was watching grow up. I mean, in nine years, kids really, wow, they change. Um, and I'm trying to enable them carefully, cautiously, totally openly, nothing surreptitious about this, because I don't want to cause them any difficulties if possible. I'm, I'm enabling them to tell their own story. So that's the next chapter. The next show I have um, hopefully will incorporate work that I've been receiving from Cuba by flash drive, CD, DVD, email files, every which way conceivable. Um, they've been sending me little, their attempts to document, tell their history, and so forth. So coming back to the beginning, um, when I was faced with this you know, tidal wave of images and Evan and I had to surf through them. Um, you know, how do you tell a coherent story? Well, again, this isn't now, it isn't just my story. It's a um, combination of impressions of community, faith, and family, which to me are the three essentials of Cuban, of Cubanidad. See, Cubanidad? Um, because each time I went, and two times I went alone, so I had nobody to help me um, a lot of the way, uh, people helped. I was taken into homes, I was taken into families, I was nursed and bathed, literally, uh, by people when I became very ill on my last trip, and it was sheer stupidity. I, I drank coffee with water that hadn't been properly boiled. It can happen anywhere, literally, it can happen anywhere. And so when I became this ill and was unable to care for myself, um, I learned a lot about Cuban, uh, about the essence of compassion. People bathed me, massaged me, fed me. I learned how to eat raw, fresh yogurt, which was a real treat. And uh, when I came home and told this story, uh, people said, oh, really? Well, that's interesting. And uh, the message is there's something to be learned here. We can learn a lot from exchanges with other people. And you don't have to go to Cuba to learn. You can, you can engage in exhibitions, exchanges, emails, etc. So what else? Um, I think may, many of you have probably heard the story. I began this um, uh, journey into the Cuban connection quite by uh, happenstance. Um, I was a professional trained practicing psychologist and then started to study photography and began to do freelance work and I was bored. At a certain point I became bored. I needed a challenge and just stepped back from my commercial work and said whatever calls to me uh, I will follow if, if I'm listening, if I'm ready. And I was at a concert uh, one evening um, for a client who is a composer whose wedding I had photographed. Uh, I was there innocently to hear the music, to enjoy. I love multicultural music rhythms. And while I was sitting listening to the concert, his in-laws were seated next to me. My husband was to my right. And there were three parts to the music. The first part was inspired by Prague. The the last part was inspired by Paris. The middle part was inspired by Cuban rhythms. And this composer has never been to Cuba. 
But as I sat there innocently listening, um, the same thing that's happening to me now, and you can't see it because I'm wearing long sleeves, the hair just stood up on my arms and on the back of my neck. And I thought, that's interesting because that's a sign. I'm very sensitive to these things. And I turned to his uh, in-laws innocently to say, oh, he should take this music and tour Prague, Paris, and Havana. They said, no, 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 he's not going anywhere, but we're going to Cuba. Without even stopping to ask when, why, I just said to my, I turned to my husband and I said, we're going to Cuba. Without, I literally didn't hesitate, not even knowing if there was room on the, <coughs> in the group. And my husband, who's a dear, sweet guy, <laughs> said, sure, okay, I'm up for it. I want to play for you, it's, I'll play just a snippet. I don't know how well you'll be able to hear this. Um, this is the piece and it's on a recording behind my installation. There's a sound installation. Later when you're walking around, if it's back on, you'll hear a mix of music that illustrates all the different threads, or many, not all, many of the different threads that run through Cuban um, communities, African, Afri you know, Yoruban, Santeria, Hebrew, Israeli, uh, Ladino, which is Spanish, Hebrew mixed together, beautiful, soulful songs that I've put on this. Alex Alviar, who is the performance manager at the center here, I have his music uh, from Ecuador because I just love listening to him. I mean, all the, the, the Latin American countries, they share the sounds and rhythms, but there are some surprises. And here is the piece, if I can get it to go. It's classical, surprisingly. Very orchestral. It even sounds like an epiphany. Sounds like what? It sounds like an epiphany. <laughs> okay, so it starts with this grand sweeping gesture, and he goes on. Some of it is too soft to hear. And very. I don't know if you can hear this at all, but later, maybe if you're interested, you can come closer. He has the dance rhythms, he has the wind, he has the surf. You can see, you can almost feel the surf on the Nalakon. You've all seen pictures of the waves and the spray. And he captured all this. You hear that? And, you know, this was it. This was the trigger. And within two months, literally, I think that was, yeah, within um, not even two months, um, my husband and I were on a little Russian-made plane. Uh, what, what's the airline from Russia? Oh, gosh. Aeroflot. Not Aeroflot. It's, uh, it was a Russian airline. It was a, we went to Montreal. On that particular occasion, we thought it was cheaper. We, legally, we had a license. We went to Montreal through a blizzard and took this little tiny aircraft that was made in Russia to Cuba, and we held the seat. I mean, our knuckles were white the whole time. It was, it was quite an adventure. Uh, and we had no time to plan. I mean, literally, we just we threw stuff into duffels. We had our restrictions, 40 pounds, a little bit more from Canada. Some of you have gone, perhaps, from other places. Um, almost every time I've gone, it's been 40 pounds. You know how much 40 pounds is? Not much. You carry 40 pounds to Cuba. That's it. Uh, I learned how to travel light and fast. And there, <coughs> I learned from the people how to economize and the stores and the products and now you know behind us are market shots well friends who have just come back from cuba i still want to say cuba so forgive me if i shift back and forth um these were the good times in 2006 2007 things were on the uptick tourism was up produce was up then they were whammied cuba was whammied with several storms in fact 2008 the summer and fall, they were hit with three successive tropical storms. Bananas were devastated, a lot of crops were wasted. And then, of course, the world economy took a downturn. And now, it isn't just our embargo, but it's a lot of it related to our embargo. They're hurting, and there are food shortages and the shelves. The shelves are lined with tomato paste and pasta, tomato paste, tomato sauce, pasta, nothing else. I mean, that's, it's like almost, it's not comedic, but it is. You look at it, you think that someone set that up. No, there's a shortage. There are real shortages. Um, that was actually one of the questions that I, I mean, that <coughs> I, I could have very easily asked you mm. offline, but I definitely wanted it to be part of this conversation is, you know, you, you made your first trip to Cuba in 2000. And I think as everybody in this room knows, as a lot has happened 
uh, yeah. the last the last ten years. So um, I mean, my my question is, how has you know you've you've touched on it in the last uh, you know in the last few statements, but how has Cuba changed you know in the last ten years over your over the course of your trips? Okay, and again, these are only my impressions, and I disclaimer right at the front of this all, uh, I I really do not want you to think that I am an expert on anything, photography or Cuba, because um, I learned by first-hand experience and by doing, but these are my impressions. So, changes. Well, uh, there definitely is a renewal of religious observance. It's very much out in the open. The churches, although a lot of them are still in disrepair, are active. People are going. Um, Judaism certainly has seen an interesting, a, 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 an up and down wave of um, increase in numbers observing and searching for their roots. Uh, people leaving for Israel, the more they learn about their Jewish roots and the more they want to strive and achieve because they're all educated and highly literate, many of the Jews are leaving. So the numbers have gone up and renewal has gone up and then people dying, the elderly of course, uh, you know, most of them aren't leaving for Israel, they're dying and those who are leaving for Israel, so the numbers went down. In the early 2000s it was 1500-ish, then it was down to 1200 and at one point when I went it was close to 1000 because they were leaving in groups of, of 100. There were big groups leaving, which was very frightening. Uh, to me, maybe not to others, but to me it was like Roman Vishniak times. I mean, the, there was gonna, nothing was going to be left. These people were leaving, taking the knowledge and the skills with them. What was going to be left? Was I documenting a disappearing society? So um, the numbers have gone up and down. Now there's an uptick in, in Judaism. I can't speak for the other faiths because uh, there are a lot of conversions. A lot of people are intermarried by necessity. There aren't a lot of Jews, fellow Jews in, in Cuba. So there are conversions and the numbers are up again, but uh, other faiths, Yoruban syncretistic faiths which were suppressed and hidden and there are hints in the other room and there's one mural here directly uh, alluding to Santeria. <coughs> that was not allowed years ago and now it's public and now people can observe their faith and it's become a real hot tourist attraction, which raises the other issue, tourism definitely is up from all over the world. Um, the downside is that my husband and I drove into isolated peninsula areas where they're just ravaging the landscape. And Cuba tries to protect, they have UNESCO sites. That's a UNESCO site um, next to where that car is. It's a beautiful park. Uh, they do protect certain areas very, very well, but the tourism is ravaging the beaches. The empty beach in the other room, the bright and barren image, will not look like that, probably doesn't look like that now. That was taken some years ago. The downside is tourism will help some parts of the Cuban economy, but not all the people, certainly. It won't be distributed. Um, <coughs> and it, it gives you this, this two-tier economy, which we all know is very, very dangerous, very dangerous and very destructive. So tourism is up, and the new crop of students at the university with whom I ate dinner, and they were buzzing over me like flies, um, that's the new industry. That is, they are gearing. It's, it's not even medicine, because medicine is suffering. That's another change. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so education is still very, very active. Tourism is up. But I'm, I'm afraid it's going to do some damage. And they're not even set. When our embargo is and whenever it is um, changed or opened up, they're going to be flooded, and they won't be able to handle the flood of people who want to go there. It's going to, it's going to have some consequences. Medicine, I had first-hand experience, um, and there are some pictures that allude to my visits at the hospitals. Everyone, well, not everyone, but many of you may know Michael Moore's movie. Uh, it, it, it isn't really like that, <laughs> not completely. Um, recently, there was a terrible, terrible disaster I don't know all the details yet, but a hospital that cared for s disabled people, and I don't know the nature, uh, had a huge number of deaths because the heating system wasn't working properly, wasn't repaired, or wasn't fueled. I don't know the details, but there's a big public investigation. And in Cuba, this is highly unusual, highly unusual to have something that public exposed, and some people were documenting this. 
And so I'm waiting to hear more. This, this is, is, a, is a horrible blow to their esteem. Uh, they don't have a lot of medicines. That's gotten worse. Um, their doctors are being exported to other countries. Of course, Haiti needs them, and, and that's justifiable. Venezuela is taking a lot of doctors in trade for oil. And so Cuba is suffering. They're not having as many doctors to take care of their own. Uh, and certainly the medicines are lacking. And so I ended up in, um, I visited this hospital. That woman is having a double mastectomy. And to her right is my cousin who lives there. It's another linchpin of my connection to Cuba. Um, this woman is going to have a double mastectomy the next day. And my cousin and friends of hers were there to be angels of compassion, to um, provide her with fresh clothing, fresh linens, fresh food. Because the hospitals do not do this. Certain hospitals, I cannot speak for all. I mean, uh, so I got to see the inside out of the hospital settings, and then I um, had a little uh, adventure. I was robbed one night, nothing major, but because I suffered a little cut, um, the policeman uh, said, you must go to the hospital. We have to go through this routine. And I left the hospital very quickly when I saw the disarray. It was like a Marx, no pun intended, a Marx Brothers comedy, um, because I couldn't tell who was the doctor, who were the patients. It was like very scary to me. It was an emergency room, which is scary to anyone. But I'm sure the care was fine, but I didn't need care. And I signed a release, and the policeman was happy to let me go. But that whole night was a true lesson in comunidad, because nothing of significance was stolen. But I screamed at the thief, um, mi visa, por favor, mi visa. All I wanted that he took from me was I needed my exit visa to leave the country. And he understood me. And as he neatly tore up and took off with other things, he dropped my visa for me. And I found it. And I traced the path of torn letters to where I suspect he lived and stood outside screaming in the most perfect Spanish, every epithet I could think of. Then went to the police station where I was treated to four hours of note taking. The police are very thorough, but they didn't catch him. They <laughs> fingerprinted. They went back with spotlights and fingerprinted. I have my fingerprints are in Cuba now. So I saw their justice system at its best <coughs> midnight, saw two police stations with undercover policemen, et cetera, et cetera. If you want a real lesson in another society, I don't advise getting robbed. But um, I actually took some, uh, some pictures that my cousin was very angry at me. You're not supposed to photograph in certain places. But I'm a photographer, so right. I caught the policeman, I caught the ambulance, I caught the door to the hospital, and that was it. Um, so yes, that's changed. It's, I would say the medical care has suffered. Um, what else has changed? You know, we talked about, you, you, you touched on um, you know, a lack of, of physical resources. Yep. You, you touched on a lack of different kind of resources. Um, but there are, uh, I was, uh, when you and I were going through the show and putting it together and, and sort of talking in some detail about some of the works, um, I was amazed to find out that, that um, for these that are on this wall, for some of them, I'm not sure for which all of them, um, that there were spiritual resources that were brought in for, was it the uh, congregation at San Fuegos that they did not have a rabbi? Ah, uh, yes, and this, this, uh, this is a topic of, of <laughs> great interest. Um, as far as the Jew, the Jew, you're talking about the Jewish communities. Um, okay, well, how does, how, does, how does it work? Is that what you're asking? Well, or? I mean, I guess the, the, the subject being, you know, an, uh, a flux of spiritual resources. Mm -hmm. um, okay, as far as I know, uh, the revival, the search for renewal started up again around 1993, and it's no coincidence the date because it was um, shortly after the Russian influence had dwined, had diminished. And it wasn't, it wasn't um, so suffice it to say, it wasn't the Cuban government, per se, that had sort of put the, the lid on religion. It was, it, was more, it was more the Russian influence. And, um, and then the Pope's visit opened that. And so then various organizations from around the world, the Joint Distribution Committee, Hadassah, B'nai B'rith, um, trying to think, and seminaries in Latin America, Argentina, Chile, they all began to send money and, and personnel. But it was never for permanent, it was never for anything permanent other than to restore the large central synagogues in Havana, which were in total, total dis disarray 
and, uh, and just falling down. And those have all been restored very nicely and continue to be kept up uh, by influx of funds, predominantly but not exclusively the Joint Distribution Committee. Um, but the question remains, um, how do the people learn and are there rabbis? Okay, the seminary in Argentina is the major source of students who come up to the central synagogue in Havana, known affectionately as the Patronato. Anyone who's ever been who's Jewish or interested in the temples, that's where they take you, they give you the spiel, they show you the pharmacy, the books. The pharmacy, a lot of that stuff stays there. It doesn't get distributed as widely. Um, the books, they could use more. And they have a beautiful computer lab run by Ort, which, um, which is really impressive, and a rec center. Spartic Center um, has been restored beautifully. Their chairs are more comfortable than the ones, forgive me, in my, in my own temple. Um, <laughs> Sephardic Shul is, has a recreation center. Used to be huge, now it's half. They're doing okay. Their leaders have all been leaving for Israel, though. They have new leaders now. And the Orthodox Shul, um, which was in total disrepair, it's the oldest, poorest population, have now got their own website. They're web savvy. Uh, they've gotten very good at attracting tourism and teaching. And it used to be, and this is another big change, the central synagogue, which is where the authority resides at the Patronato, used to send tutors to every province. There are approximately 10 to 12. And I have a map later I can show you where the communities are located. They used to send tutors out to go around the country teaching for bar mitzvah and rituals and Shabbat. And I just heard, and I was shocked and, and despondent to hear very recently that that has stopped, and I don't know why I have to investigate what the reason is. The uptick, the upside is that the young people who are leaders, the boy who's becoming a bar mitzvah in that picture, the boy in the other room becoming a bar mitzvah, this young lady becoming a bat mitzvah, and others who are in some of the pictures are stepping up to the plate. They're all rising leaders. They're being trained because their parents you know, aren't going to be there forever. And they are having to assume responsibilities that uh, they sort of kind of been trained for, but now they're being thrown into it. Um, the spirituality is marvelous. The religiosity, as with many religions, is a little behind. So spiritually, you know, you sit in, in a temple anywhere or in a house which serves as a sanctuary in the countryside. Most of the countryside is they meet in homes. Um, and uh, you listen to the davening, the praying, and you just want to get up and dance the salsa to it because some of, especially the Orthodox, I've been to many, many services and I've recorded them, sound like Spanish auctioneers playing salsa music. I mean, it's like fast and cadence and it's like very rhythmic. My husband was carrying the Torah around in one of the temples as, a, as an honor and I really literally thought he was going to start dancing with the Torah. It was fun. Um, spirituality is palpable in Cuba. You can't avoid it. I mean, the people, it's a kind of sensuousness and an openness um, to, as with my, the hair is in the music episode, uh, being open. They're very open. They're, they're trusting people, which is what I'm, I'm concerned with, the, with, the, with an increase in tourism and too rapid an increase that, you know, these are very trusting, very open people. They want, they want to embrace the outside. They want to be included and involved. And um, I, hope, I hope that uh, there's some means to, um, you can't protect people. They, you just have to see what, what it will be. Um, the, leaders are, the leaders that I've met, I've met imams. There's a Muslim community in Cuba. There's some Muslim rhythms on my sound piece. If you listen, you'll hear pieces that you'll wonder, why, why is that on there? There is a Muslim, very tiny population. The imam I met was very bright, very curious. Um, the leaders of the Jewish community are very dedicated, uh, and they're overwhelmed. I also have to say that the leader right now who assumed leadership after a very prominent, very tightly controlling leader um, died unexpectedly and too soon, uh, Adela Dwaran, who many of you have met, was thrust into this role. And it's been a huge challenge for her because um, there are so many demands from within and from tourism. You know, the tourists, we make demands. We show up with satchels of goodies, meds and books and money and whatever. 
And, uh, you know, it feels good, but you have to think, <coughs> how is this going to be handled? Is it going to be handled, handled pro properly, appropriately? Which is why I stepped back and started to say enablement also is very important here, not just assistance. And I chide, and I will do this, I will do this tonight, I chide people that when they do go to any other country, not just Cuba, um, to be aware uh, of your actions that they could possibly do more harm than good. Well-meaning could do more harm than good. You have to be aware of other people's needs and respect their boundaries. And, um, and, and, and just these are fellow human beings. Uh, they're very proud. These people are extraordinarily proud. And private to a degree, which I feel very humbled and honored that they have let me into their lives because um, it's a kind of presumptuousness that we as Americans often have that we can go and do good and help and fix and mm, it gets Yeah, I think that's, that's one thing that I, I really want to bring uh, to the conversation is that, you know, I think it's very easy with this exhibition to, to come in as a viewer and to, uh, to see these images and to immediately emote. Um, you see these images, and, and whether you're Jewish or whether you're Hispanic, um, you see, I think, part of yourself in, yeah. in a lot of these photographs, and it happens immediately. And I think that one thing that should be very, very clear um, is that those moments that are captured, that are captured on film uh, by Linda um, are the result of, of a relationship that has you know, happened over nine years. Um, and there was a lot of work that went into being able to be invited in and be a part of that moment. And some of them were just lucky. <laughs> right. <laughs> some of them right, were just of course. lucky. That yeah. should be, yeah, the, let's throw that out there too. Um, but that's, you know, that was one of the, the, the things that I was so attracted to uh, about this project is that, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we inevitably find ourselves talking about um, in these artist talks here in the gallery for all the exhibitions that we do is what is the route to your own heritage? What is your understanding of your heritage? Um, and for many of the shows here, that question has to do with our Latino heritage. That has to do with our Latin American heritage. And this show poses a very, very different question. Um, it doesn't ask you um, what your, it, it asks who you are as a, as a human who you are as a human being. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I was, my, my sister and I are fifth generation American. So we, uh, before that, you know, my, our family was in Mexico. So we haven't been Mexican for five generations. Um, but we identify as Hispanics. Um, we were raised Hispanic. Um, I was the first one over there eating those empanadas. Um, <laughs> the, moment, the moment that they got here. Um, you beat me. <laughs> Um, but I, the, the point being that, um, you know, I was raised in America um, and, uh, you know, all of my other colleagues at the center, they each have their own story. Um, you know, some of them are first generation and some of them are fifth generation. And we all come uh, to this place on a different road. Um, and I think one of the really incredible things about this exhibition is that you get to ask yourself that. Um, you get to look at these images, you know, the, the, we were talking about these a moment ago, that beautiful young girl at the bat mitzvah um, and the, the boy at the bar mitzvah above her. Um, you know, for a lot of the residents of this neighborhood um, that Javier, you know, told you a little bit about our community, um, for a lot of the residents that, that will walk through here, they will immediately identify with those people mm. because they look Hispanic. And yet that image will be so foreign to them um, because of the religious nature of that photograph. And so it allows so many different kinds of people to be a part of this dialogue. Um, and I think that that's such, that's, we are incredibly blessed to be able to have that conversation here. Um, we are incredibly thrilled um, that Linda is the one to be able to bring that to us. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the photographs themselves technically, you know, are quite, uh, are quite exquisite.